Hi, everybody. Welcome to this uh, webinar for the Let's Communities Decide campaign. This is the third uh, in our series of campaign webinars. And it's one way that we, as, uh, uh, as a dispersed campaign that's taking place in localities all the way or all around the country, can come together to share ideas, um, get a sense of what each other are doing, share inspiration, um, get some input and, uh, and support. And for us, as like you know, the sort of central campaign team, it's a way that we can kind of get some information out to everybody and do our best to, to get behind the campaign that's blossoming all around the country. So today's webinar, we've had two webinars so far that um, have covered in a way, outlined the entirety of the campaign. We'll do a bit of that today as well. Uh, but we're going to have a particular focus today on working with our elected representatives. You might remember if you've tuned into previous webinars that there are three main prongs to uh, our campaign. Uh, one is outreach, uh, another is public mobilization, um, and the third is, is lobbying our elected represent representatives. So um, get, bringing our MPs and councillors on board and of course, there are, there, are, there are more effective and less effective ways to do that. So um, we hope we'll be able to um, further equip um, all of you to do that really effectively in this. Basically, in the campaign, the ministers who proposed uh, you know, this, this change to the planning laws, this outrageous change to reclassify exploratory drilling for shale gas under permitted development, the same category as for garden sheds and fences and conservatories, they're only really likely to consider abandoning this if they come under pressure from different angles. And one of those key angles is pressure from, from MPs and from, from councillors. They need to be feeling that pressure. And so we want to be asking and enrolling our MPs and councillors to carry that fight for us and to make strong personal representations to those ministers. So um, maybe we'll just pop on and uh, I think Fai, who's, I haven't introduced myself. Fai's going to introduce the presenters and everybody who's on the call, but um, I'll start with me. So uh, I'm Sebastian and I work with 350.org, which is one of the, the organizations and groupings that um, came together to, to try and help and support and kickstart this campaign. Fine. Thanks, uh, hi everyone. Uh, as I just mentioned, I'm Fai. Um, I work for Friends of the Earth, um, who is uh, another one of the organizations in the coalition working um, to prevent these outrageous proposals. Um, I work on the fracking campaign, and we've had a very active fracking campaign for a number of years. Um, yeah, so excited to work with others on this. Um, we're really fortunate to be joined by two guests today. Um, uh, firstly, we have Joe from Hope for the Future. Um, there's an organization um, made up of specialists um, in climate lobbying. So we'll be hearing from Joe a little bit later on. Um, I'm look, really looking forward to that. We also have Steve from Frack Free United. Uh, Frack Free United are a grassroots network organizing to stop fracking. Um, so he'll be coming in later to talk to us a little bit about what they've been doing. Um, so really excited to be joined by those guys today. Great, thanks, Fai. Uh, Fai's got an eccentric mic, which is why she's got to hold it up to her mouth in that way when she talks into it. So let me just run you through um, a bit about uh, of the content, uh, the agenda for our call today. We'll run for an hour, so we'll be uh, done around 8 p.m. And between now and then, um, we'll give you just like a short outline of the campaign, uh, update on the campaign, and then we're going to uh, go into a section that, uh, that Joe's kindly going to um, present for us, which is, which is going to be um, looking at most effective ways to, to lobby, to bring on side, to engage uh, our elected representatives. Um, I'll, uh, I'll uh, keep the contents you know, for, for Joe to, well, I don't know of the contents, so um, that'll be a surprise to me as well. Um, when we're done with that, we'll, we're just going to cover, um, there's been some great work put together 
done putting together the 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 most strategic asks both for our MPs and for our councillors, uh, and we'll we'll run through those, and then um, we'll have space for uh, for questions, ideas, suggestions, thoughts from all of you out there, um, and that goes for the whole of the way through through uh, the proceedings as well, but we'll have a specific space for, for that. And then we're going to hear from Steve at Fret Free United about things that they've been working on. Um, hi, Steve, they do like great work, uh, in the, the grassroots organizing and mobilizing. Um, and then that'll be us done. So we'll wrap up around 8 p.m. And uh, job's a good one. Um, Let's see what else we were going to cover. I think finally you're going to talk about how to join in. Yeah, we'd really encourage you all to be using the chat box that you should be able to access on your screen. Um, please do post us any comments or updates or information that you'd like to share. And we'll do our best to share that as and when we can throughout the video call. Um, and also this is an opportunity for you to ask um, any of us as well as our guests any questions that you might have. Um, so please do keep Putting those in, um, we'll be seeing those as they as they come up, and we'll try and address them at appropriate points throughout the webinar. So, yeah, please do do that. Thanks. And just to say, if we don't get to anybody's comments or questions um, in advance, just to say, you know, sorry about that. It can only depend on the the amount of them coming through and so on. And uh, please don't be insulted if we don't get to them. But hopefully, we'll get to you know plenty or maybe all of them. Okay, so. We'll move into our uh, next section with the, with the webinar, which is to give you a bit of an outline um, of the campaign. Um, it's in section and the campaign to date, and uh, Fai is going to do that for us. Thanks, Seb. Yeah, so as Seb mentioned um, in the welcome, um, this campaign has, has grown up um, as a result of government um, announcing in May that they want to reclassify exploration for shale gas as permitted development. Permitted development is um, a process to make, you know, putting up your garden shed easier. So we really don't think it's appropriate um, for drilling for shale gas. Um, if this happens, it means that companies no longer need to apply for planning permission through local councils. Uh, it removes, as a result, the rights of local people to have their say um, in whether or not um, this drilling infrastructure goes ahead on their doorsteps. It's a gross assault on local democracy. It could also speed up astronomically the scale of fracking here in the UK, which as a result of some incredible campaigning at the grassroots has meant that we haven't had any fracking here for seven years. Um, but if these proposals were to go ahead, it would speed everything up and could potentially lead to the mass industrialization of our countryside and contribute to climate change. Um, so government are consulting on this. Uh, they opened a consultation on the 19th of July. It's open for 14 weeks and so will close on the 25th of October. It's open to everyone and anyone to submit to, whether you're on behalf of, you're from an organization, whether you're an individual, of a local group of campaigners anybody can input into it um, and we know that um, I know from us as a coalition um, we're working at the moment to create guidance for people to do that and um, so that's one of the ways in which we would be um, campaigning on this it does mean that we've got a relatively short window of opportunity to try and influence this so what we're hoping to do is to create as much of a stir as possible about these proposals so first and foremost doing lots of outreaching, getting the news out there. Lots of people would not have even heard of these proposals. Um, so making sure that everybody in people's local communities knows not only um, about permissive development, but about the impact that um, drilling for shale gas on this scale would have um, on their countryside and on the wider climate. Um, we're working uh, in coalition with a number of organizations um, so a few of them on the call today, so Fact Free United, 350.org, Friends of the Earth, CPRE, and a number of others are all working really closely in coalition um, to try and 
create lots of um, lots of media attention around this, to put a lot of pressure on government ministers and make it known just how unwanted these proposals are, and to support and equip and encourage local groups and activists in local communities to lobby their MPs, to get their councils on board um, and make lots of public statements opposing these plans. So there's, there's lots of things that have already happened and lots of things that are underway. Um, and we're really confident that if we continue to work together and we continue to try and recruit new people to, these campa to this campaign, um, so people who might be outraged by an assault on local democracy, um, it does this this campaign is not just you know it's not just about climate change it it's about so many issues there's so many things that are wrong with this these proposals um, so we're hoping to work with as many people as possible um, to make government ministers aware that this is just really unacceptable um, and so it's just a really brief overview of kind of of, of, of the issue at the moment um, and what's going on. I think Seb's going to give a little bit more detail now about some of the latest developments and about some of the things that we, we've we been sorting out for local groups to be using. Great. Thanks, Fai. Yes, so the dastardly government is trying to um, sneak the proposal through under the radar um, to the extent that it opened its consultation just before Parliament went into recess it didn't announce the date until the day before the start of the consultation, those kinds of dirty tricks. But we're not going to let them, are we? And the uh, campaign's already like beginning to, like, to build up a head of steam. Um, CPRE and Friends of the Earth uh, have just done some polling amongst Conservative councillors. You may have seen this come out, um, which showed that they polled uh, Conservative council councillors in, in areas where fracking companies have a license to drill for gas and found that 80% of the, this is of conservative councillors, remember, who are members of a party whose actual policy is pro-fracking, 80% of them believe planning applications should be required before any drilling starts. So that's a, so that's a great, uh, it's a striking and it's a, a great, it's also a really great campaign resource to have, to have those statistics behind us. Um, those statistics generated some good media stuff. There was good coverage, for instance, in the Mirror uh, and uh, in the Independent. And I also wanted to share with you a few quotes from um, an article written actually in Conservative Home. And Conservative Home is, uh, well, the home of the Conservatives online. And uh, one of their councillors wrote a pretty hard hitting uh, piece on there. Here's some of the things he wrote. Um, he says, the government seem intent on proving that fracking is a special case deserving special consideration. Nothing short of teacher's pet treatment where the industry is given a free pass not to abide by the usual rules. I don't see the case for that. Good on him. Um, and uh, obviously, we don't see the case for that either. So, um, so things are starting uh, are, are starting to roll. We'll talk a little bit more about like the public mobilisation and and what's happening in out across the country and local groups a bit later on. Um, I wanted to run through quickly some of the resources that are available um, for the campaign. These resources are all available online and uh, um, mostly on the Let Communities Decide website, which is www.letcommunitiesdecide.org. And there, if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll find a section uh, of, of resources. There's a, a campaign briefing there. There's a guide to engaging MPs and councillors, so covering uh, you know, so, some of the territory that, that we're going to be looking at this evening. Um, there's a briefing for MPs and councillors, which you can leave with them after you've gone for a meeting with them as additional information, or perhaps uh, if you're emailing them, send them you know, as an attachment as additional information. There's also a, an open letter, an online open letter, which uh, uh, we really encourage you to ask your elected representatives to sign up to. Um, 
and uh, you'll find that as well. You can find that as well from the Let Communities Decide website. On the homepage, top right, you'll see it. It's, there's, a, there's a link to open letter on there. And then there's a Let Communities Decide Facebook group. This is a great source and resource, um, a great source for information. You know, there we'll be posting any like articles that are coming out, um, news, tips. There'll be a place where, where in your campaign, you know, you can ask for advice, suggestions, input, share ideas, and so on. So it's a bit of a kind of a, a community space for the campaign. If you go on Facebook and just search Let Communities Decide, then that will take you there. Am I forgetting things? Oh, yes, I am. The campaign map. So there's a campaign map which is on the Let Communities Decide website on the web page. And on there, if you've got campaign activities happening in your area, please uh, put them onto that map. There's a little link to the left of the map. You can't miss it on the site. So just fill in a fairly simple form and uh, submit your event. So that's some of uh, the uh, elements that we've uh, put together to support the campaign out there. Shall I just carry on? Great, I'm just carrying on. So the uh, the so talk around the the support for for um, lobbying effectively lobbying our elected representatives takes us on to the next section which is which is looking at that exact subject and uh, to help us do that um, really want to uh, welcome Joe from Hope for the Future who's uh, kindly come on to share some of their um, research and practice with us to help us to be as effective as possible. Are you happy to take this away, Joe? Yeah, thanks very much. I'll just share my screen. Hopefully that's come up for everybody to see. There we go. Great. Um, yeah, so my name's Joe and I head up Hope for the Future. Um, and we, um, we, I suppose we spend half our time um, researching what are the best methods for lobbying MPs on climate change and related issues? So we interview MPs and accompany people to um, meet with their MP uh, and trial different techniques and different approaches um, to see what works well and what doesn't work well. And then the other half of our time, um, we, we spend putting this into um, uh, training packages that we're sharing with um, some of the major NGOs working on climate change right through to individuals and grassroots. So that's a little bit about us. Um, you can see our website there, um, hftf.org.uk, if you want to find out a bit more about what we do. Um, usually we sort of run a four hour course. So I'm going to try and squeeze this into 20 minutes. Um, so, yeah, if you have any questions or you'd like any help, um in in sort of following up with that then yeah just drop me an email and i'll be happy to help um i'm going to talk i'm going to start with a case study um uh, that sort of demonstrates i guess kind of the, the the crux of the things that we've learned about what works well working with mps and local councillors um i'll talk a lot about mps throughout um uh, throughout the session just for brevity's sake most of this works very well with local councillors and a lot of it with with anybody in a position of power or authority. Um, and yes, yeah, so I'll start with a case study um, and then I'll go on to um, talk a little bit about how you can prepare for meeting with your MP um, and create a sort of lobbying strategy. And then um, we'll have a break. And after that, I'll talk about some conversation techniques. I haven't chosen to talk about the practicalities of contacting your MP or local councillor to set up a meeting, because I'm aware that there's probably quite a lot of experience um, it, amongst the people listening in on this today but again if you're having trouble setting up a meeting or you're not hearing back from them or whatever um, again just drop me a line and I'd be happy to help. Um, okay so um, case study this is Philip Davies um, some of you might know him I'm going to start my timer so I don't waffle on for too long um, yeah some of you might know Philip Davies he's, he's famous as one of the uh, five MPs who voted against the Climate Change Act in 2008 he's 
Um, he's also very well known in lots of other ways, filibustering, uh, voting against sort of common sense legislation like banning smoking in cars where children are present, that kind of thing. So generally a very pleasant man to be around. And we worked with a group of constituents who really wanted to um, to, to try and get something positive with him. They'd heard from lots of people that, that you know, they'd gone to see him and it was just a, a bit of a showdown each time. Um, and the way in which we approach this as we approach most meetings with um, uh, MPs and local councillors, especially when they're challenging, um, is to look for what their pre-existing interests um, are because MPs actually have no guidance about how they use their energy or their power um, and their resources and their time um, in the local constituency. So a lot of it just comes down to what they're interested in. So you can try and sort of nail your MP and try and get them to sort of see where you're coming from and prove them wrong. But actually, if you haven't got their personal interest, they can just walk away. Um, so actually trying to find a way that, that actually you can capture their interests, and we'll talk a little bit more about how you can do that works really well. So it turns out that he had an interest in fuel poverty and so um, and air pollution. So that's the route that we went down. And we said, look, you know, we're here about climate change. We know you care about air pollution and fuel poverty. Let's do something about air pollution and um, housing insulation and let's work together. And um, as much as he tried to sort of create confrontation and derail the conversation, we, we were sort of ruthlessly searching for common ground. And um, we managed to get some really good results out of that. Small, small, but good. He asked some parliamentary questions, made some inquiries, did some work on, on um, uh, air pollution in the end. OK, so that was the first step. But the next thing is, you know, build, building a good rapport. Great. OK, where can you take that and how can you develop that? So the next thing was, let's put on a local event and let's up the ante. Let's do it on climate change specifically and renewable energy. And we'll have him as a panelist. Um, and. Yeah, I was, I was pretty nervous at the beginning of the event. Uh, one of the opening questions was comparing Philip Davies to the MPs during the slave trade. So it was like pretty tetchy kind of atmosphere in the room. Um, and I thought, oh my goodness, this is gonna go so badly. Um, but actually um, it worked really well hearing from these different panelists and the relationship that had been built up. Um, one of the people that chaired the panel discussion kept it very constructive. She was part of this original meeting with Philip and we managed to, build some really good ground, common ground um, in, the, uh, in the meeting. And at the end of the event, Philip said, you know, I, I have actually shifted. I have shifted. I can see it's man-made um, climate change. And um, he, he's um, currently working on um, putting battery storage in the local area. Um, and so next step, we're going to do a schools workshop with him. I'm going to see how far this can go. And so I guess if there's one thing that I'd want to communicate with you today, it's the value of building a good working relationship, even with the most frustrating of MPs, um, because if you can do it with Philip, you can do it with absolutely anybody. Um, and it is that strong working relationship where you establish a good rapport and you establish trust um, that actually time and time again, we hear from MPs what campaigns have worked well. It's those campaigns that have worked well. So how can you go ahead and do this? Um, so just some ideas. Oh, you can see here, this is some of the questions that he asked after that local event um, to do with renewable energy, which is great. Um, so finding common ground, how do you do that? Just notice we've got a couple of um chat things but i think i'll come back to that um so finding common ground how do you do that well um what i'd recommend you do is you make a list of your agenda what are the things you want to communicate about fracking and then you do a lot of research into your mp and you find out what makes them tick what interests them um right down to you know are they somebody who learns through facts and figures are they somebody who, who you think learns through um going and doing something uh you know are they a visual learner how do they learn what you know why did they go into politics in the first place with philip it was he wanted to, to be seen as the local hero. He was born and bred in the local constituency and he wanted to be seen as, you know, this person that was making a difference to his lives. He was not interested in the same way in national politics. So that's why we sort of majored with him on that constituency angle. So you find, you know, your agenda, their agenda and what the common ground is. And that is your starting point for your first uh, letter or meeting. Um, and hopefully between now and October, you've got time to, to certainly send a letter and meet with them and maybe even have a follow up meeting so you can build on that. 
Um, this is sort of what we did, what we did with Philip, um, which I've sort of already explained, but I'll send these slides around if you'd like them and you can have a, a sort of uh, more in-depth look at that. Okay, so how do you find out what makes your MP tick? Well, probably a fair few of you will be um, familiar with theyworkforyou.com. You can find out who your MP is and how to contact them on there. Um, and it will tell you all sorts of things. So if they have any ministerial roles, right through to how much they use alliteration, so you can kind of see how smarmy your MP is, that kind of thing. Um, and you've also got things on there like their appearances in Parliament, um, uh, which I think is probably the most useful thing to pay attention to. Things that they bother to actually stand up and talk about in Parliament are the things that, um, yeah, they're the things that um, they tend to be really passionate and interested in. That and also when they've rebelled against their party as well. Um, okay, you can also have a look at their social media and website, um, have a look at um, the local area. Um, have a look on YouTube, you get a real sense of how they talk and, and who they are as a person. So just being really thorough in your research. Um, let's go back again. From that, you can kind of pitch your asks. Um, and you've, um, Sebastian's talked about the sort of range of asks that you have um, there um, for climate change. My chat box is going mad, so I'm actually just going to check that in case I'm missing something here. Uh, not quite sure how to do that. Um, two seconds, sorry. Fine, yeah, good. Just wanted to check you could all hear me. Um, great. Okay, so. Yeah, so once you've done your research, you can get a sense of kind of where your MP is on a scale of sort of one to five um, about their view on fracking. Um, and sort of, you know, one, like they absolutely love it through to five, where they really, really hate it. Um, and from there, you can pitch your ask. So persuasion research has shown you can only move somebody one or two along that scale um, in one engagement. So for those of you that are working with particularly challenging MPs and you might feel disappointed coming out of that meeting that you know they're not right up there on the five really opposing fracking, but you may have just moved them along one or two. That's really, really valuable. Um, and you know, and then in your follow up engagement, you can continue to do that. So um, just being aware of that. And when you go in, having a sort of range of us, depending on where your MP ends up at the end of that meeting can be really useful. You'd hope that actually just talking about fracking and um, uh, sort of all, all the benefits that are often not fracking would be enough to persuade an MP to want to do something about the changes to these proposals. But it's not always enough. So it may be worthwhile also offering rewards um, to your um, to your MP or local councillor. So what kinds of rewards can you offer? One of the things that um, elected representatives um, we've seen over and over again tend to like is um, the idea of having a working group on a particular issue that can offer them the latest statistics, information, research on a particular issue. So you can offer them as a reward for working with you, improved knowledge and understanding. Say to them, you know, every, every one or two months, can we send you, you know, a short brief just updating you on where this is? Um, and yeah, that can work really well. Um, some MPs really, really value having that access to that resource because they have to know about so many different things and it can be quite intimidating. This one, I think, um, is, is probably the biggest asset that the fracking or the anti-fracking campaign has, providing a constituency mandate. So actually, there'll be a huge amount of pressure coming, particularly with Conservative MPs coming from the party um, to support um, these proposals and there's this really difficult tension for MPs because if they want to make a difference and they have to work their way up the slippery uh, pole to become a minister but in order to do that they have to be loyal to their party so um, actually providing a, a, a constituency mandate and saying look this is really unpopular in your local constituency and we can prove it we've done this poll or for example you know you can paint a picture of what it will look like when people start seeing these mega trucks coming in through um, their quaint little villages um, and, and how unhappy people are gonna be about that. 
We saw that just recently with Heathrow Third Runway. Uh, Greg Hans um, was a senior minister and he had to step down. He lost his job overnight because um, the constituency that he was in um, would not support the runway because of air pollution and noise pollution. So that can be really, really powerful in getting through to an MP. Good publicity. Um, always, you know, if you're on Twitter, if you're on Facebook, great to meet with da, 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 with a photo or, you know, I write for this local magazine or um, I have this blog or I'm working with this number of people. Just dropping that into the conversation gives them a sense in which um, you're really tied into the community and um, you're there for somebody to, to listen to. Um, and another thing as well, just talking to them about, you know, the idea of legacy and, and tapping into that idea of wanting to leave a good legacy. The vast majority of MPs, however, it ends up going when they get into the role, go into becoming an MP or a local councillor, particularly local councillors, because it's a voluntary, more or less role. Um, they go into it for good reasons. They want to, you know, they believe they can make a difference in the world, regardless of what happens when they get into that role. So just tapping into that a bit, and um, what's the legacy that you're going to leave as an MP? Um, and you know what what's going to be left for future generations um, after this industrialization. Okay, I think I'm going to pause there. Yeah, I'm going to pause there, take a break, um, and we'll talk about conversation techniques in a minute. Great stuff. Thanks a lot, Joe. That's absolute gold dust. Um, so we're just pausing very briefly. Uh, uh, you're in the uh, Let Communities Decide uh, campaign video call. Uh, a big welcome to anybody and everybody who's uh, joined since the beginning of the call. Um, currently, we've got Jo from Hope for the Future, her, who's sharing some gems about the most effective ways to engage MPs and councillors uh, to effectively lobby them to uh, put pressure on ministers and to speak out publicly around this issue and become champions of our cause. Uh, please do use the chat box. It'd uh, be great to hear from you with uh, uh, all and any questions, suggestions, ideas, thoughts, and so on. So please do get in touch. Great. So if you're happy to carry on. Oh, I'm just having my attention drawn to, to, uh, some, to something. Oh, yeah. So um, if anybody was on the last webinar, might remember that um, we had Barbara from Lancashire um, uh, appearing on the webinar and uh, um, she's here just uh, reminding us about about their meeting with their Conservative MP Mark Menzies and uh, filed constituency I think it is um, and uh, uh, and that they got a good result out of their meeting that he, he opposes permitted development that's despite the fact that he actually is in favor of fracking so uh, it goes to show i guess it's it's uh, it's another it's something else that in uh, that partly um uh, is kind of proof of the pudding that joe's talking about here that that good results are possible even with what might seem like unpromising raw material, so to speak. And I know that in that case, uh, part of what has got their results has been a process of building up a relationship, a good relationship with that MP so that they are seen as kind of, um, uh, how could you call it, sort of credible witnesses, as it were, you know, to, to what's happening out in the world. So uh, great work, um, all of you in Lancashire, and great work to everybody um, who's out there uh, engaging with your MPs and councillors um, right across the land because we know that there's a lot of that um, going on right now in a really concerted way and uh, it's so heartening always to, to hear about. Okay, I think we're good to carry on if you're happy to, uh, to, to carry on, Joe. Great, uh, here we go. Okay, so... Um... Yeah, you've done your preparation, you know what your, your starting point is in terms of your MP's interests um, and you know, you know what your common agenda is. Um, you've got an idea of several different asks and where you'd pitch them depending on how well the conversation will go and what kind of rewards you're offering. Um, so I'm going to move on to conversation techniques. Um, just start up my timer again. But before I do, I just sort of wanted to mention a few uh, concrete examples um, about you know how how you can relate your MPs pre-existing interests so for example if you see that they have an interest in wildlife then that might be 
the angle in which you would want to talk about fracking, the impact on local wildlife. If you see they've got an interest in climate change, that one's obvious. If they have an interest in finance, we know that fracking is not financially viable if, if, if you're going to keep to climate change targets, which we're legally bound to. Um, talking about the recent heat waves, um, if you've seen they've been active on that. Um, there are all sorts of ways in which you might see um, that they are, in, you know, they have something that relates to fracking in some way, and and that would be the thing that you'd want to major on and really hone in on. And and it is actually sort of been proven that it's better to kind of choose one angle and go for that angle rather than sort of trying to throw the whole lot of them. Um, so you know, have a couple of contingency plans. But uh, but yeah, okay, so. You're in the meeting, um, you probably have between 10 and 15 minutes in the average meeting with an MP, you have usually a little bit longer with local councillors. If it's going really well, you might have half an hour and even an hour with an MP or I've even got to the point where it's like, can you let me out now because this has been an hour and a half and that's when you know it's going really well. Um, but yeah, be prepared for the fact that you really might not have long and the fact that the previous meeting they might have had maybe if they fit four in an hour over seven hours, 28 meetings that day or whatever that adds up to. Um, the previous meeting might have been about potholes and the next meeting might be about benefits and the meeting after that might be about badges. So they're bombarded with a lot. So just being conscious and aware of that. Um, okay, I think we've, you know, we've all seen, I'm gonna talk a bit about here, MP defensive behaviors. So this is when you're in a meeting and it's not going well. And I'd like to prepare you for that because if you can do that, you can do that with any MP. Um, and we've all seen, you know, excruciating interviews where, where MPs have put up that glass wall and you just can't get through to them. Same with local councillors. Um, and I want to outline some of the things that you might see from an MP who's on the defence or looking for a bit of confrontation to derail the conversation. Um, and just by noticing them, it can hopefully help you to take a step back and just respond differently rather than a knee jerk reaction, which is certainly um, how I responded at first. So. Um, holding the party line, I think we're all familiar with that one, cannot get a straight answer about how they actually feel about the issue because they're just parroting um, the party line the whole time. Controlling the conversation, so not being able to get a word in edgeways. Inattention, I've actually seen MPs scrolling through social media whilst constituents are trying to talk to them. Um, refusing concrete answers. Uh, so, you know, I, I wouldn't like to commit to that just at this particular moment because, again, you can't get a straight answer out of them. Deliberately antagonising, one of my first MP meetings was with a group of constituents and the MP sat there and said, you know, well, everyone has their pet issue, don't they? You know, and you, you can't you can't uh, attend to them all. And of, of course, someone was really infuriated by having climate change talked about as a pet issue um, and uh, and they sort of flew off the handle and it derailed the conversation. And it was it was a complete waste of time because at the end of it, the MP didn't have to agree to do anything because they just spent the whole time debating. Um, so it was an excellent way to waste time and get out of actually committing to do something. Sweet talking, the opposite of this. Um, we see a lot of this. We did an evaluation for the Climate Coalition's mass lobby of MPs a couple of years ago. Um, something like 78% of people reported having positive meetings with their MP. The rest said it was neutral. No one reported having a, a negative meeting. All seemed to go really well, but only to commit to doing something. So there was an awful lot of sweet talking going on. Um, and then, yeah, feigning surprise or powerlessness, powerlessness. Oh, I, you know, I'm afraid, um, you know, as a minister, or I, I'm not really very sure how that process works. We actually see that more from female MPs. It's something to be aware of. Uh, Feigning surprise, this is a relatively new one to us. We worked with a constituent who was in a meeting with an MP uh, about a particular policy issue and the MP was very shocked about this policy issue. Um, the same constituent was then in another meeting with a different group on the same policy issue and the MP was equally shocked and surprised about the policy issue again, not having realised that he was in both meetings. So yeah, there are all sorts of ways that the MPs are on the defence. So how do you overcome this? Well, sometimes just understanding why someone is on the defence can help you in thinking about ways you can put them at ease, which ultimately is what we have found is the best way for building that sort of golden working relationship that you want, regardless of how frustrating you find them. So I'm going to give some suggestions about why MPs behave like this and along the way what you can do to sort of overcome come that and put that at ease. Um, so what's it like to be an MP? 
I mean, we, we all hear that, you know, it's it's like a really pressurized job, but I I was really shocked when I first started learning about the reality of what it's like for most MPs. And the first time I heard about it was from John Battle, who's a former Secretary of State, and he um yeah, he was a Leeds MP and he'd get down to, you know, first train down to London on Monday morning and he'd work through till 11 every night till Thursday, last train back to Leeds, get in at three in the morning. And he was up at seven to do a full day of constituency meetings on the Friday, full day on the Saturday, try and do the family thing on Sunday and back in again on Monday. And he did that for 12 years. Um, so, yeah, there are real genuine time restraints for MPs. And as I mentioned before, the, the whole massive broad range of issues are brought to them and some MPs, most MPs go into the role with absolutely no training whatsoever. There is no MP induction, it's just like get on with it. So um, what we've often seen um, can happen with campaigners who are particularly knowledgeable is they go in there with this report and that report and these figures and these figures and the MP is actually completely intimidated and that is when they start talking rubbish because they don't want to be seen to be lacking in knowledge and that's my second bullet point there um actually you know they don't want to be seen to not know what they're talking about and that can really put them on the defense so sometimes just really really dumbing things down and being mindful of making sure that the MP feels um, like they're still in control of the situation and you're not exposing something that they're lacking knowledge on can be really helpful. Um, limits as a local MP in tackling global issues, my third point there. So um, I think, yeah, we've all kind of had that sense of climate change is such a massive issue. What can I do about it? There's a real psychological barrier there. And it's the same for MPs, um, especially because um, if you read recent research, for example, by Rebecca Willis, it will tell you that for many MPs talking about climate change is still seen as a career limiting move. So you have to like really believe in it to say something about it. Um, and there is this sense in which, you know, my job is to represent my local constituency. This is such a massive issue. So again, where, where you'll want to major is, as I've talked about before, kind of really grounding it as much as possible on the local impacts and how unhappy the local voters are going to be about this. Um, being constrained by the party line, seeing campaigners kind of go in there and say, why has your party done this and your party's done that? And instantly you put the MP on in a very, very difficult position because they have to defend um, their party unless they're utterly uninterested in getting a promotion or they really, really disagree with something. They also have to defend um, their you know, or, or, or keep happy their voters and their supporters actually keep them in the job. And then on top of those two things that they're balancing, they have to have their own opinion uh, and, and trying in some degree to stay true to themselves. And MPs are constantly having to weigh up those three things. So if you go in there and you're, you're, you're putting them in a difficult position about their party, um, it immediately puts them on the offence. I'd uh, avoid as much as possible party politics. Um, and again, just keep it grounded in the local Votes, obviously, you can lose your job overnight, not just because of a snap election, um, but as I, I gave the example of Greg Hans, um, who lost his job as a minister overnight because he voted against Heathrow Third Runway. Um, you can spend decades as an MP working towards a promotion and lose it overnight. It's brutal. Um, so, yeah, that that definitely takes its toll um, in all sorts of ways, including mental health. Um, Poor perception of campaigners, just like we hear all sorts of horror stories about MPs in the news. Um, they read all sorts of horror stories about us as campaigners, um, as extremists and alarmists and aggressive. So anything you can do to undermine that perception um, of campaigners is really, really helpful. Um, that you know we're good people to work with, that our knowledge is based in fact, that we're open to other opinions, um, but also have integrity in our own opinion. Anything you can do to just show yourself um, as not this kind of irrational caricature that's that's been put, put forward in the media is really helpful. Um, and yeah, um, I've mentioned about career demands already and how MPs can lose their job overnight and just, just being mindful of that um, and um, being in the job at Hope for the Future has really changed my perception of MPs. I don't necessarily think that they do a better job than when I originally started in the job um, myself. You know, I, I still have um, 
I'm still as cynical, I guess, about the effectiveness of MPs in lots of ways, but I am um, feel a lot more compassionately towards them than I did before. So, so I sort of build those relationships and understand what a challenge it is to be an MP. Um, finally, just going to finish off with um, when you're there, sat in front of them, how do you start? Because starting is the most difficult part. Um, get in there and outline your purpose. Tell them right from the off why you're here. I'm here to talk to you about these proposed changes. Your hook, you then want to outline why they should bother listening to you. So put in something there about the interests already. You can, it'll show that you've done your research. I saw that you recently spoke up about this in Parliament, so I think you might be interested in this. Or the rewards that I talk about, I'm, you know, I'm going to be inviting the local media or whatever it is. And then finally, your map, outline, you know, the, the different particular areas you'd like to cover. That helps in several ways. Firstly, an MP can know where the conversation is going and begin to think of answers and what they want to focus on and not focus on. It puts them at ease. And secondly, they know how much you want to cover before you go, so they're less likely to just waffle on and take up the 20 minutes that you've got with them because they know you're not going to go to you talked about those things. And you should be able to cover all of that in one minute because MPs have quite a small attention span sometimes too. Uh, they've been sat in meetings all day. So practice that in advance. Have that ready. One minute, how to outline those things. And once you've got a good start, hopefully the meeting from there will go really well. Don't forget to thank them afterwards. Send a letter following up on what they've agreed and what you've agreed. Um, and yeah, I'm going to stop there. But any questions, just drop me a line. I'd be happy to help. And Great, Joe. Thanks so much for that. That feels so valuable and um, also like really appreciates uh, the work in like distilling down what we've already heard is like otherwise a, uh, a four hour, actually a four hour training and managing to try and cram, <laughs> you know, the sort of the best of that into, into 20 minutes. Really appreciate, yeah. appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks. And, uh, Pleasure. That, that'll be so valuable to our campaigners. So we've heard um, that about from, from Joe. Um, we also heard that we had, you know, MPs have got very real constraints on their time and, and so do we. So we'll crack on to um, just covering uh, what is it that we want our MPs and councillors to actually do, Fi. Um, yeah, just to echo Seb's comment, Joe, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so once you've got your MP on side, you think they're quite warm to your issue, They've kind of given some hints that they're going to maybe follow up with some action um, and stay true to their words. What is it that you can be asking them to do on this campaign? Um, we've been having a little bit of a think about what would be some effective and meaningful things to ask them to do. Um, and I'm just going to run through some of those now. So first and foremost, ministers behind the permitted development proposal need to feel under pressure from their MPs. So the first and foremost call is to write to primarily two ministers in the first instance, raising their concerns about permitted development um, and asking that the changes are withdrawn. And so those ministers are is Claire Perry, the Minister of State for Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. And then the second is James Brokenshire, Secretary of State for the Department for Housing, Communities and Local Government. So those are the two that we think it'd be most effective for MPs to be applying pressure to within government. Um, there's also a number of additional actions that you can ask your MP to take. Um, it'd be great if you can get some of these in as well. We currently have an open letter, which is sitting on the Let Communities Decide website at the moment. Um, if you can ask them to sign up to that letter, that would be fantastic. We'll be publishing that and delivering that at the end of the consultation um, and using it to just go show the scale of opposition amongst, amongst councillors and MPs. Perhaps your MP could ask parliamentary questions on the issue at the Minister's Departmental Question Time or at the Prime Minister's Question Time. At whatever opportunity they've got, they can be asking questions publicly then that would be fantastic as well. Um, of course, there's also submitting to the government's consultation. Um, as we mentioned earlier, that's live at the moment and is open until the 25th of October. Perhaps the MP could be promoting the consultation to, to their own constituencies, um, it, to their own constituents, sorry, and asking them to make submissions. Um, if your MP could be doing anything to raise the issue in the local media, then that would be really beneficial as well. 
Um, and perhaps they could be doing some more public things like tweeting about the changes that are being proposed. Um, so that's kind of a mix of privately um, M asking MPs to privately lobby ministers and government and then a series of public actions that show the weight of opposition um, to MPs, um, to the proposals rather. Um, so those are some of the, the, the kind of key asks mapped out for MPs. We have got this all written down and listed in a really clear and easy to read guide that's on the Let Communities Decide website. It's under the resources section and it's called a guide to engaging MPs and councillors as well as listing all of those asks. It's, um, as well as listing all of the asks, it also gives you some tips building on some of the stuff that Joe was talking about, um, but includes a little bit more information on kind of like how to get a meeting, different ways to communicate with them. Is it possible to email? What makes a good letter? Those kinds of things. So that information is in that guide as well. Um, yeah, so I think, so that's, that's MPs. Of course, we've mentioned that Getting councillors and council leaders on side as well um, is a really, really effective thing to be doing um, in this campaign. And Seb's just going to chat you through what would be a useful thing to ask them. Okay, so pretty speedily, let's rattle through some of these asks. The primary ask for councillors is different to that for MPs. The primary ask for councillors is to ask them to sign that online open letter that you can access via the Let Communities Decide website. If they've agreed to do that, there are some other uh, asks. Uh, it would be great if they'll, you know, if they'll take up the cause further. And here they are. It would be great if they too can write to those ministers, to Claire Perry at the Department for Business and uh, Energy Industrial Strategy, and to James Brokenshire at the Department for Housing, Communities and Local Government. Again, expressing their, their concerns and asking for the proposal to be withdrawn. It would be great if they can send a consultation, uh, sorry, uh, if they can send a submission to the government's consultation for them to raise the issue in the local media by, for instance, sending a press release and for them to use social media to raise awareness about it and to express their opinion. So, for instance, to tweet about it. Again, that's a, so that's a, a whole bunch of, of asks and you'll have to use your skill and judgment to, you know, to decide uh, which of those to, to pick out of the, the extra asks, if any, depending on the degree of your councillor's interest, you know, involvement and commitment. Great. Super, thanks, Seb. Um, okay, looking at the clock and... Um... As probably to be expected, we're kind of like running out of time a little bit, um, but we still have um, space and schedule to hear from Steve from Frack Free oh. United. Um, so welcome, Steve. Um, we've got a few minutes left to hear from you about all the fantastic things that Frack Free United have been doing, and maybe you can share a little bit about kind of what's been working um, in your area as well. Um, so I'll hand over to you, Steve. Yeah, basically, I think Frack Free United's role in this has been networking some of the community groups to actually start engaging in, in campaigning. Um, we've produced this, with this, of course. Uh, we've now distributed, uh, I think, we're up to 70,000 leaflets now across community groups across the UK. Um, and we're also sending out this new poster to everyone as well, which is really, really useful. Um, I think, to be honest, and there's not really much I can follow on for. I think you've covered most of it, apart from the fact that we're asking people, as many people as possible, to, to respond to the consultation, not just the councillors, not everyone else, but it has to be as many responses as possible. Um, if there's any more information that anyone needs from us on leaflets or posters or stickers, the 10,000 stickers have just gone out, so we're doing a new print run now, is to drop us a line on Track for United either through the electcommunities.org page or um, via the Facebook page, and we can put them on a list to send more out. We're doing another print one beginning of next week. We have a lot of orders already, so it's a real first come, first serve basis at the moment for us. That's me. Super, thanks, Steve. I was just wondering, we've got, we have got a little bit more time. Um, would you be would it be possible for you to explain a little bit about some of the shows that you've been doing in Yorkshire? I've heard oh yeah, well, it's not out. actually quite, well, quite, Frackley United aren't actually doing the shows. This, this is really good stuff that the local groups are doing. Uh, Frackley Riedale and Frackley East Yorkshire have just done two of the big agricultural shows. I think 
Driffield show was the biggest show in Northern, in, in England, I think. Um, so they, they've just done some outreach there. And we're, we're kind of encouraging people to, to go to as many shows as possible. I know Knotts have just done a, um, a show this weekend. Uh, I believe Lancashire has some shows coming up in the next couple of weeks. So, But I would ask people as well to, as Seb mentioned the map earlier on, is to put the events onto the map because then we have a rough idea or a good idea where these events are happening and we can start a real snowball effect on this campaign because the more visibility we have, the more pressure it's going to put onto the MPs as well, the more pressure it's going to put on the councillors in the area because they visit these shows. Um, at Rydow, for instance, I think we managed to speak to seven of the local county councillors in the area, I think. And, you know, and we, we have to remember that, that these councillors are... Uh, are there because they want to represent the community and make a difference. But this is this is a massive thing for them. If they lose the power to make these decisions, that's really going to affect their, their reason to be a councillor as well. So so but apart from that really it is this case of just, just cracking on getting out and doing what the community groups groups do best. And that is going out campaigning in local communities. It is, it is all we can do to provide the stuff for people to do it. Um, you know just just go out and do what they do best. Thanks, Steve. And if anybody on the call does want to get in touch with you to kind of order any materials or potentially have a little bit of a chat about um, any advice about community engagement, how can they get in touch with you? Well, they can, they can either get in touch with via the, uh, the social media or they can just drop me an email at um, uh, steve at fractoryunited.co.uk. Super. OK, great. Thanks ever so much, Steve. Okay, so we're really fortunate to have been joined today by Steve and Joanna. Thank you so much for that. Um, unfortunately, we are nearly out of time for today. So I think we're probably going to have to wrap up. Um, but a recording of this webinar will be, um, will be available on the website soon. Um, it'll also be um, on the Fossil Free um, Facebook page where you're viewing it now. Um, so it will sit there and you can review it, share it with friends, encourages, encourage um any other kind of local community organisers to watch it and get some tips as well. Um, we also have a host of resources available on the Let Communities Decide website. So that's www.letcommunitiesdecide.org. I think, yes. Um, that's it. So do go there. There's also a sign up on that web page. Um, so if you are interested in organising in your local community, getting in touch with us um, for a little bit of support in putting on any public meetings or creating local action plans, um, please do sign up on the Let Community Decide webpage. We'll be in touch via email and we'll be sharing more resources, more tips, inviting you to the next webinar and letting you know about any actions that are coming up soon, any events. Um, so please do sign up there. That's a, a great place to start. Um, Super. I think, is there anything else maybe over to Seb for one last thing? Yes, basically, just to say uh, all power to all of your elbows out there, to everybody who's working so hard uh, on this campaign. We we've, we've, haven't had the time uh, on this uh, video call to, to, to report back in about, about the things that are happening all around the country, but we'll make sure that we, we, can, we give a good block of time to that the next time. But there are things happening everywhere, and... Um, a lot of like appreciation, admiration and respect to all of you that are working so hard on this campaign. And let's just like keep it up. There's a groundswell building and uh, we can win this. Bye. Bye.